introduce our speaker for today, Andrea Creel, who's a doctoral candidate in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. And Andrea actually was one of the many students who came to take Anthropology 229A here in the department. Um, she is distinguished, I think, as the only non-anthropology student from those cohorts to successfully apply for a National Science Foundation graduate research fellowship. So although she's in Near Eastern Studies, I think we can count her as being an anthropologically sophisticated scholar. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of being the outside member of her committee and seeing her develop the work that she's doing um, on the, the sort, of, uh, sort of more spatial uh, inter, inter between places in an area where most of the archaeology, I think, has traditionally looked at settlements. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more about the presentation of this. The final thing I should say is some of you may recognize Andrea because she also has taught in Anthro to AC um, within anthropology as a GSI and is currently a GSI in the cohort of Anthro to GSIs. So, Please welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this talk is um, essentially based uh, from my dissertation. Um, and I had intended on it being a little bit more polished than it's ending up going to be. Uh, my idea was that the chapter from which I'm doing these case studies on that I talk about in my abstract um, would be complete and I would be kind of talking to you guys about what I came up with in that chapter and kind of maybe getting feedback from that. But I was like sick throughout the entire month of September and now I'm a little bit behind. Um, so um, I'm gonna still go through those case studies but it's not quite as polished and as developed as I, I still like it, still, still a little bit in that kind of preliminary developmental stages. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who like things come to me as I write is how I work. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the first part of this talk is based upon all the work I've already done in the dissertation and completed chapters. Um, you know, I have a, an introductory chapter where I talk in depth about, my, about methodology, uh, and then I have another chapter where I talk about some of the textual sources um, that I'm drawing from. And then a third chapter where I'm talking about uh, the long, uh, ar the archaeological history of this landscape, um, and what that has to do with some of the methodological concepts I'm talking about, especially liminality. Um, and then in the, the chapter I'm currently working on is when I bring this into uh, the particular time period of the Iron Age and start talking about like how does what everything came before impact how we interpret or should be interpreting these sites of this certain time period. So. With that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, uh, this talk will be kind of partially me reading things and partially me just talking things out. I'm going to kind of switch back and forth. So to begin, to the untrained eye, the Sinai Negev in southern Jordan may appear stark and empty, a vast, lifeless, unchanging horizon on the edge of nowhere. Indeed, communities in the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean often perceive these lands and their inhabitants as peripheral and marginal, if not dangerous and barbaric. However, thousands of years of archaeological remains, often still visible today, and that's a very important point, attest to quite another picture. This is a sedimented landscape, a palimpsest, where multiple communities inscribe themselves over the millennia. Many of these communities subsisted on a flexible patchwork of pastoralism, foraging, and limited agriculture, trade, and mining, framed within the punctuated and cyclical movements of pilgrimage. In so doing, these communities actively drew on the visible past and movement through an arid landscape to constitute and cultivate their identities and an entangled connectivity with neighboring regions. In the Iron Age II, which is uh, 1000 to 600 BCE, the, the first part of the first millennium BCE, the rise of the Assyrian Empire both facilitated and constrained this connectivity. The Assyrians bounded and funneled the flows of people and material through this region in ways that foreshadowed the later empires of Rome, the early Islamic Caliphates, and the Ottomans. However, local communities drew on the ancient meshworks of pilgrimage and the visible past to generate and foster new senses of self and ways of seeing in the midst of empire. 
So this talk hopefully analyzes the interaction of ritual movement, ritual movement and empire in the Iron Age as the confluence of multiple and overlapping senses of liminality unique to these lands. I suggest that both local and outsider communities, albeit in different ways, perceive these lands in terms of the potency of ambiguity and transitions. In the dry lands, this potency manifested as a distinct and complex interplay between movement and mobility, arid aridity, marginality, and betweenness. I utilize evidence of roadside ritual at Horvat Kitmeet in the Negev and Kuntilat Ajrud in the Sinai as particularly pertinent case studies in understanding the complexities of ritual and multiple overlapping liminalities in the dry lands under the shadow of empire. So first, I want to talk about these sites or just give a really quick background of the, of the sites and where they are. Um, so Kuntila Dejrud is way over here in what is today the northeastern Sinai. The, uh, the, the boundary line between the Negev and the Sinai is right, is right along here. Um, it's completely a modern political boundary. There's actually nothing there to, uh, to, to say that that's actually a boundary. Um, in the past, uh, communities moved back and forth over this region like it was no big deal. <laughs> um, and Kuntila Dejrud uh, was excavated um, in the mid 70s by a Tel Aviv University archeologist of Meshel. Uh, this was during the actual occupation of the Sinai by Israel. Um, he wrote up preliminary publications in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, the material was eventually returned to Egypt in the mid 90s with the peace accord, uh, but then it wasn't actually finally published until 2012. So I'm working with stuff that was excavated a while ago under some unclear circumstances and um, is, uh, was only published fairly recently and the publication leaves some to, something to be desired. So the site uh, became famous though, kind of started the stir though because it has these references to Yahweh and to seem, the seeming references and inscriptions to Yahweh and to a, a proposed consort Asherah. Um, and so often the site is, based, is discussed in terms of Israelite or Judean religion and politics, and it's often identified as an Israelite or Judean fortress or way station. Um, so and the site dates to like the 8th century BCE, and it's very interesting that it's often identified as Israelite or Judean because uh, the Judeans would be up here. <laughs> The Israelites would be even <laughs> further up here. <laughs> um, so my other site is uh, Horvat Kitmit, um, and it dates to a few decades later. Um, and it was discovered during survey linked to the excavation of Tel Ira over here. They were surveying this whole land. It was, also, it was also basically a survey in which they were doing because the military was moving out of the Sinai because of the peace accords, and they had to survey all this area up here so that the, the military can move their bases up here. Um, and so it was excavated in the mid-80s, uh, um, although uh, a lot of stuff was collected from the site before there was actually any official excavations. Um, and then it, wasn't, it was finally published in 1995, and this particular site, it's uh, hailed as an Edomite shrine in the biblical Negev. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with those terms, um, Edom is generally, refer, is generally used to refer to peoples who lived in the Iron Age in southern Jordan over here. And then this area here is often thought of as kind of the, the, this Judah client polity extended itself down into the northern Negev. Um, and then there's also lots of arguments about like, oh, the Edomites, they came over here and they, like, there was like, they fought with each other and they established stuff over here. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So, so as I was kind of already noting, there's problems with these interpretations. Um, having to do with uh, uh, the relationship to their surroundings and where people's act in their material cultures actually are, but also having to do with the fact that the material cultures of these sites are highly idiosyncratic. And often these ethnic identifications of the sites are based on a very small portion, whatever the authors of the site decided was important in order to attribute an ethnicity or a political um, identification to the site. So I think that there's more to these sites, though. Um, and then they, as a result, can, and because of the highly idiosyncratic nature of the sites and their context, that they can provide us with insights on 
uh, liminality and connectivity and a host of other things in the Southern Levant and just kind of in a broader sense of, um, in order to talk about other places as well. So I'm gonna start with my concept of, or not my concept, but the concept of liminality. So this concept has been around for a long time in academic literature. It was originally coined by Arnold von Jennep in 1909's The Rite of Passage, in which he focused on rituals that mark the passage of an individual or social group from one status to another as particularly evocative and intense in the human experience. It's derived from the Latin word for threshold, so it has this spatial uh, metaphor going for it already, although that's not really how um, it was used by von Jennep. Um, so liminality refers to a person, place, thing, or state of being that is betwixt and between, a transition, something that is neither here nor there, not easily categorized, miscellaneous in process. And furthermore, and this is something that people often don't talk about when they talk about liminality, is that um, according to Van Genep, there's something special, something powerful about being in this in-between state because sacredness itself is a uh, variable, contextual, and above all, relational. Something he called the pivoting of the sacred, and he actually described it as these rotating circles, just kind of moving all around. Um, so unfortunately, um, von Genev's work received very little attention until its translation into English into uh, 1960. He was ahead of his time. Um, and once it was translated into English, that's when Victor Turner comes in, and he started to famously, he famously deployed the concept in several of his works in the 60s and the 70s. He's the one who started using the term betwixt and between, and, um, and so on and so forth. So since then, the term liminal has become ubiquitous across many disciplines as an explanatory mechanism for anything that doesn't fit. The word is often simply tossed around without explanation or elaboration. Rarely does anyone try to deconstruct or complicate our understanding of it. Um, now, what I find interesting about the concept and about, and you see it in this kind of notion of the pivoting of the sacred, is that it is inherently about movement. The act, the process of transitioning, and the power therein, the power of movement, whether that's movement in a physical, social, representative, et cetera, sense. So in von Genev's work and in my dissertation, liminality is also intimately interrelated with religion and ritual. So I just wanted to go in really quickly um, how um, I'm kind of use, using these terms. Um, a big fan of Thomas Tweed's definition of religion, where he's using this languages of confluences and flows to talk about it. Um, they're, they're conf uh, religions as confluences of organic cultural flows and intensify joy and confront suffering by drawing on human and superhuman forces to make homes and cross boundaries. And this is because Tweed is specifically interested in a theory of religion that addresses three key themes, movement, relation, and position, all of which are themes that I'm interested in and I think work really well with notions of liminality. And he emphasizes these two orienting categories of metaphors, which are also relevant, the aquatic metaphors of confluence and, confluences and flows to express that religions are not reified substances, but co complex processes, and the spatial metaphors of crossing and dwelling in order to index that religion is about finding a place and moving across space. So in this sense, then, we can also think of ritual as movement, a process. And Catherine Bell kind of touched on this a little bit when she talked about ritualization, or, or ritual as ritualization, a way of acting that is designed and orchestrated to distinguish and privilege what is being done in comparison to other usually more quotidian activities. So and in this, Bell is drawing from uh, Bourdieu's practice theory, adding sense of ritual to Bourdieu's list of the abstract senses of the socially informed body. So I also found some recent works by um, Carl Knappett and Tim Ingold especially helpful. Um, and this is these notions of networks and me meshworks. Now networks have been around a lot in, in, in archeological and other kinds of literatures. Um, but I'm, uh, I was interested in how um, Knappett was deploying this, these notions of, of networks, especially when he talks about, when he really kind of emphasizes the nodes of networks. Um, and the links between the nodes. And he actually really goes into a, a more precise way of talking about networks than you often will often see it kind of deployed in some of the literature. Um, 
And he allows us to kind of think about physical and social connectivity simultaneously. Um, but there's also been like a critique of, of networks. Um, so like Ingold in an earlier work had, has already kind of talked about how the problem with networks is that it focuses on those nodes and not what's between the nodes. Um, and he, it, you know, it comes from this, the, the notion of networks that originally was supposed to refer to actual nets. Um, but then in this day and age has now been kind of more identified with like information technology and railways and communication networks. So the movement, so it's really emphasizing the, the, the nodes over what's going on between the nodes. And so Ingold wants to kind of go back to that and he employs this notion of, of mesh work. Um, and in meshwork, in this model, the lines and their entanglement are emphasized because the lines of the meshwork are the trails along which life is lived. So Knappet, in his work, actually kind of noted this critique of networks. Um, but he thinks that it allows, it, networks is still a useful object because it allows for interactions to be broken down into, um, into entities that we can then use for analysis. And he wants to use uh, meshworks as like, you know, that way you think about it in experience, but networks is the way that you actually analyze it. Um, so, but I kind of suggested that we don't need to, we don't need to oppose these two terms. Um, I think we can understand them as two different ways of tacking between, of understanding phenomenon. Um, so the, that way we could, that is, we can think of them as the analysis of complex and intersecting phenomenon that requires a sense of flexibility a deafness of methodological movement in which we may employ multiple models and perspectives on the same sets of archaeological data. So the notion of meshworks allows us to attend to phenomena as entangled movements. Well, the notion of networks allows us to focus on certain nodes and clusters of nodes within the meshwork that may be particularly visible at any given time and the relations that constitute them. And on that note, um, I think Manuel Vasquez has uh, done some nice work where he's responding to Tweed's hydraulic model. And he wants to bring in networks also to kind of, to work with um, hydraulic models as well, because hydraulic models can tend to be like very anti-structuralist and kind of can run roughshod over, you know, details and particularities. And so Vasquez talks about how we can also think, uh, we can also use networks to think about how movement is bounded, how it's constrained, how it's funneled and thus in how one ways in which of movement um, is power. So um, also in their discussions of connectivity, Knappet and uh, Engel do either, both also implicitly or explicitly draw on notions of place and landscape. Um, these are notions that we also are already kind of familiar with in archaeological phenomen phenomenologies of landscape. Um, and in an earlier work, Engel defined landscape through what he called this dwelling perspective, which kind of goes along with this notion of a meshwork. That is, the world as it is known to those who dwell therein, who inhabit its places and journey along the paths connecting them. Um, so that then we know we can think of landscape as not just a physical environment, but it's something that involves all the bodily senses, and it's it's something that we live within, and it is a part of us, and we are a part of it. So we're thinking about connectivity in terms of place and landscape, in particular landscape in the Levant, which I am. Then we uh, circle back to this notion of liminality. Uh, despite the fact that liminality is derived from a spatial metaphor, um, Van Genep uh, actually said very little about spatial liminality, but he does have this little section where he talks about neutral zones. These are the spaces between claimed territories such as deserts, marshes, and forests that he says are distinctively subject to the pivoting of the sacred and so are especially potent. Given on that note, so I like to talk about the Southern Levantine drylands, which here um, includes the Sinai, uh, the Negev, Southern Jordan, and also includes uh, a, lot in a lot of Northwestern Arabia as well. Um, for the, my work on my dissertation, in order to like contain and like eventually finish, um, I talk very little about Northwestern Arabia, though that's something I can definitely see is uh, because this area is, people often don't think of it as going along with this stuff. 
But if we start thinking of it in that way, it actually is going to change a lot in this, as to how people are interpreting all of this material up here. Um, and there's, somebody, there's some kind of work that's slowly being done about that right now, um, but in the past has not been done. Um, so I refer to this collectively as the Southern Levantine drylands. These lands lie between Egypt, the Mediterranean, and the Red Seas, Southern Arabia, and the Southern Levant. Different things to different people, these lands have been home to indigenous mobile pastoralist communities, a source for special materials, copper and turquoise mines are in, you see there's a lot of turquoise, copper and turquoise mines down especially in the southern Sinai, and then the Negev, especially the southern Negev, has a lot of uh, copper mining going on in, all, and over here into uh, part of southern Jordan as well. Um, and then it was also a series of roads crisscrossing one another, connecting their surrounding areas, the paths that transport goods and people from one place to another. Finally, it's where gods live, where the divine is at hand. So these lands are marked as marginal and liminal by their neighboring regions. But more significantly, though, the Southern Levantine drylands take on an acutely nested sense of liminality by the, virtual by the virtue of the fact that they are the liminal spaces to other liminal spaces. The entire Levantine littoral, which includes modern Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, is located at the crossroads of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Beginning with some of its earliest communities and even into our present era, the Levant has been marked as a hub for trade, travel, and military conquest. This was the place that people, objects, and armies regularly travel through to get to other places. The Levant is the place in between in this part of the world. By the same token, though, the Levant is also inherently a place of connectivity, um, a co of constant interaction of movement, which is also often distinctly visible in a material culture that deftly blends indigenous traditions with influences from across the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Um, very often when people are talking about what makes something Levantine, it's, it, it's, it's, it ends up being like a hodgepodge of things that look like they come from other places. <laughs> Okay, so the Southern Levantine drylands then, located in the southernmost portion of the Southern Levant, are the periphery of the periphery, which may lend itself to the notion that this land was seen as especially potent. S certain texts allude to this fantastic potency in the minds of neighboring communities. Egyptian texts often referred to the drylands as the land of turquoise, over which Hathor presides, and by the term Bia which variously may mean mining country, remote, treasures, wonders, metals, what the stars are made of, and it's often associated with omens and miracles. According to Assyrian and biblical sources, these lands are filled with fantastic and supernatural creatures, such as flying serpents and two-headed snakes, a notion that survives in the writings of Herodotus a little bit later. And in the Hebrew Bible, it is the place from which Yahweh comes and the place in which he engages in his most intimate encounters with humans. What these sources all have in common is that they often mythologize this landscape in a number of different and often contradictory ways, often painting these lands as desolate, inhospitable, uninhabited, or filled with creatures, persons, and entities, both real and imagined, but always larger than life. Archaeological evidence also demonstrates a long history of human occupation in which small communities subsisted on goat sheep pastoralism, some agriculture, some foraging, uh, the mining of these precious materials, copper and turquoise, and trade. Um, how indigenous communities conceived of this landscape is not accessible via text. They didn't, they didn't leave us any text. But we can see how much the land played into their sense of ritual by the dense scatter of open air ritual sites constructed uh, largely within the sixth to third millennia BCE, um, with often with evidence for continued use or reuse in later periods, going on up into the Islamic periods as well. These sites include uh, these what we call standing stone sites. Um, these are single or groups of standing stones, um, and they're just kind of worked or semi-unworked stones. They're usually 
uh, they usually don't have anything else on them. They're just stones set vertically on the ground. Um, and they might be associated with offering tables, altars, and basins. We also have these open courtyards of single course field stones that are associated with similar installations. And we also have a lot of these geoglyphs. Um, of their circles, lines, and often also these zoomorphic creatures, and they come in various sizes and various creatures can be shown in them. And then the other big thing that we have are uh, tombs. Um, and there's generally two main types of tombs. You have um, this kind of tumulus style of tombs where there's like a little cyst burial in there and then they kind of laid these flat rocks over them in, in a mound. Um, and then you have uh, uh, these ones called uh, nawamis. Um, and these are circular, are beehive-shaped rock structures with corbelled arch ceilings. And then there's a lot of tombs that are kind of somewhere in between these two as well. <laughs> um, but the point is that all of this stuff is visible and it remains visible on the landscape for up until today. Um, and so as more and more of these sites are constructed and remain visible, even after their abandonment, they re interacted recursively with notions about the land to create an ever-increasing sense of potency to the landscape. And one way in which um, they create this potency is their relationship there to these indigenous mobile pastoral communities. Um, recently, Joy McCorston um, wrote a book about um, pilgrimage amongst mobile pastoral communities in Arabia. And keeping in mind that a lot, uh, we have this movement, a lot of these, these communities that are in Arabia, they're moving up into the Sinai, the Negev, and southern Jordan as well. They're kind of <coughs> moving back and forth and shifting over time. Um, and they have a lot of the same materials in Arabia. And McCorriston kind of dis, um, defines these as this uh, kind of a landscape of pilgrimage. And that you have these mobile pastoral communities. They're doing their thing, being mobile, being pastoral. And they're moving to different places along the landscape in, and kind of proclaiming swaths of territory in their movement. Their movement is their form of, of, of stating that this is our territory and our land. Um, and they generally, and they often set up, uh, and you know, they have these stops along the way, places where they, where they camp out. And these stops are often associated with water sources, and there's often ritual sites associated with them. And in the sense that at the same time these guys are moving, because they're moving with the herds and they're moving for subsistence reasons, it's also conflated with, uh, with ritual and with moving from one holy site to another. And McCorston refers to this as a pilgrimage-making society, unlike people in, the, in Mesopotamia who live in houses, uh, and she, what she calls like a house-making society, these mobile pastoralist communities um, make pilgrimage, and that is how they constitute their identity and the land around them. So this landscape that's just scattered with ritual is added to by the Egyptians as well, because they're routinely making expeditions into the dry lands in order to mine copper and turquoise in the third and second millennia, mostly in the southern Sinai. Um, in the process, they frequently interact with indigenous communities, and they mark this landscape with um, reliefs, statues, and architecture dedicated to their gods. The most elaborate example being the one I'm showing here of a temple to Hathor at Sarabet el Kadim in the southern Sinai that was in operation throughout most of the second millennium. So in all this, there is yet another um, set of nesting liminalities to consider um, that has been kind of heavily implied to up until this point, and that is of roadways and crossroads within a marginal landscape. Roads are another liminal geography as they both join and divide landscapes and places, and crossroads are you know, inherently betwixt and between spaces. And the recent edited volume on roads in the broader Sahara Arabian desert, uh, Reimer and Forrester have discussed desert roads as both intricate networks, capillaries, that allow the passage of people, goods, and communication, and as embedded linear structures, an integral part of the physical landscape, both shaping and shaped by the land. <coughs> 
I also kind of bring in um, Edward Casey's uh, work um, here, um, and he talks about um, the body and the landscape as both an interplace and an intraplace. <coughs> and I think that ro we can think of roads in kind of a similar way. They have a similar relationship with the landscape as the body does. Uh, they're intraplaces and that they're places within places, and they're interplaces, the places between places. So these, thus we can think of roads as places that are increasingly inscribed over time with their own specific set of features. Animal and wheel tracks, provision depots, and various types of road markers, including stele and petroglyphs. These features also inscribe the landscape, adding to its potency and allowing for those journeying along the roads to imagine the travelers and perhaps the supernatural entities who came before them. So by the time the Iron Age rolls around, that's early first millennium BC, this already marginal and liminal landscape is literally littered with past evidence of various kinds of human activity, much of it originally ritual in nature, and much of which by this point might have had its origins shrouded in, in mystery and maybe looked different, strange, and otherworldly, creating a distinctive atmosphere steeped in memory and magic. Then in the Iron Age, we see some new things that are increasingly integrate the dry lands into the ancient Near East, even as they ultimately remain marginal to the area. And that is, so we have the large scale expansion of the copper mining industry. Um, the domestication of the camel and the adoption of the tent by mo mobile pastoralist communities. This really increases the distances that mobile pastoralist communities can travel and it contributes to the rise of the Arabian incense trade. Um, they both traded up into directly into uh, the, with the Assyrians, but they also, it's also thought that they traded up towards the Mediterranean as well. And then, and of course, this also brings us to the increasing hegemony of the Assyrian Empire. So the effect of these is to increase the flow of goods and people through the dry lands and the interactions of indigenous communities with non-indigenous communities. Yet this increased interaction may only have served to further exoticize this landscape and all that it contains, thus increasing its uh, ritual potency. I suggest then that we might reinterpret the materials that Contilla de Jrod and Khormat Kitmi then within the context of this ancient sedimented potent landscape in its communities that we may envision these sites at the intersection of multiple overlapping and conflicting communities and as nodes through which materials, communities, and power were funneled. Furthermore, I suggest these sites also index uh, or may also index how local communities fostered new senses of self and ways of seeing in the midst of an ever encroaching empire. Both Kintilla Dejrud and Horvat Kitmit are single period ritual sites located on roadsides and the intersections of crossroads in an arid landscape visibly marked by ritual in the past. Thus, the ritual activities of these sites would have drawn on quite the assortment of overlapping and nesting liminalities, interacting recursively with each other, the land, and the people within the land. However, it should also be known that each of these sites would have expressed these nesting liminalities in their own distinctive manner, which is derived in part from their specific geographic and temporal context within this landscape. So I don't know if I'll be able to really get into both sites, but we'll, go, we'll talk first about Kuntilad Ajrud, um, which Kuntilad Ajrud lies on an isolated plateau in the northeastern Sinai with no sedentary settlements anywhere nearby. The closest um, one is 50 kilometers away and may or may not have been occupied at the same time as Kintilid Ejrud. Um, this is an area of the Sinai where there is t there's usually less mobile pastoral activities, but we do there is evidence of it, although the survey data is not incredibly great. Interpretation of the site has been fraught and varied, as I kind of alluded to earlier. But it's a position on the roadside next to a series of natural wells, um, likely indexes the site served as a place of rest for those traveling along the road. However, the site is distinct in its architecture and material culture. Uh, first off, you'll note that it doesn't look like anything else that's been I've talked about so far. <laughs> um, um, and it, Many of the things that are going on at this site kind of are thus suggesting that there's something new, there's something different happening here, and that also in that ritual played an important role in the construction and maintenance of this site. Um, and this partially has to do with uh, 
when we go when we walk into the, the, the excavator of the site kind of had separated the site up into a building A and a building B. Building A is an actual building. <laughs> building B is a series of features and semi-eroded rooms and things um, that actually, like, until the final publication came out, nobody even knew what this area looked like, even though it's probably actually the most important part of the site. <laughs> um, and so this actually um, functioned as the entryway into the site. So I want you to imagine for like 30 or 40 years, um, everyone knew of this building and no one knew what this looked like. Um, knowing what, that this is here and what's in here, I think kind of dramatically changes or should have changed how people interpreted the site. Um, So as you can, so there's this, you have this series of buildings and things on, on either side of, kind of, of what is a mud plastered pathway. And this thing here is really interesting because it's, in the literature they often refer to it as a, as a bama. It's this big giant uh, rectangular thing made of rocks. <laughs> and in generally um, in the Southern Levant, um, this is a site of ritual. This is where I, some sacrifices or offerings were made on top of these things. So it's likely that this is where anyone who was visiting the site, that this is where rituals um, were actually performed and, and witnessed by, by the visitors. And as such, this area funneled and constrained movement in, into and through the rest of the site. Um, building A is interesting then um, people kind of always often assumed that, uh, because they didn't really know what was here, um, that people kind of walked up here and then they hung out here because you have this, this entryway here that is covered in plaster and these benches. So these benches, there's line, line up around here, everything, the walls, the floor, the benches are all covered in plaster. Mm -hmm. This area is too, this is all plastered, this is plastered, this is plastered. There's paints, there's um, the remains of paintings along the walls. There's uh, inscriptions appearing on doors. Um, and what's interesting about this site is that it has this kind of, also, and this building here is that it has this kind of fortress-like appearance to it. Um, but it's, it's not actually, it's not made very well. It couldn't actually ever sustain any sort of military attack. And then another thing that's interesting about this here is that this very much has the appearance of a city gate the, with the way that this is walked through and with this bent axis approach as well. And then just to show you really quickly, so this is it, um, this is it comparing it to so that other site that's 50 kilometers away that was a fortress. This is what it looks like. It may or may not have been um, actually active at the time of Quintilla's Rud, but if it wasn't, it's likely that this layout was at least visible to, to the people who built Kuntilad Ezrud. And here I'm showing you a very bad photo of that plaster lined bench room area. So Kuntilad Ezrud features um, on number of, of, or featured a number of artifacts. Many of them are just simple util utilitarian uh, vessels. Uh, but the vessels are all, especially the small vessels, are all concentrated in that entry room and in these two little tower rooms that were connected to it. Um, and you also have this gigantic, I think it's like 200 kilogram stone bowl. It's got a blessing on it. Um, you've got these giant pithoi and the walls, which are also which are covered with all sorts of inscriptions and, um, and images. And, the, and both, both of which are often invoking notions of fertility, life, birth, continuity, rhythm, music, dancing, and divine and royal power. I'm just showing you. I hate to like run through these two. But this is, so these, and these two large pithoi, um, one of them was in the bench room and the other one was just inside in the courtyard area. Uh, and it's thought that they might have both originally stood in the bench room. <laughs> And then this is the other, the other very large pithos. So this site has confused uh, 
people who work in the Southern Levant uh, for several decades and consider it continues to confuse people. Um, but I suggest that many of the things that we find confusing about the site make sense in light of its specific context within this landscape. So just north of the site, though it's unclear where, uh, the excavator of the site noted that there's these very visible geoglyphs near the site. Um, and there's also a campsite over here. The relationship of the campsite to the rest of the building is unclear. But I, this kind of made, uh, given everything that I've been telling you about the landscape and people kind of revisiting sites, and especially given that this was a site with natural water, as a natural water source, and a, and a, very, and a part of the Sinai where there's, you're, you're, you're hard pressed to find water. Um, I think we should consider this site within the landscape of pilgrimage associated with sources of water. Um, that as a sort water source, Contilda, yes, would have served as a sanctuary for weary travelers, a welcome respite from the harsh conditions of the dry lands, and as an opportunity to thank the gods for a safe journey thus far and request, and request continued protection the rest of the journey. And that this site is currently dated um, to the early 8th century BCE. Um, and this is, interesting, this is interesting because this is before the, the Assyrians are encroaching on the colony of southern Levant, but they haven't made any direct inroads into the dry lands. Um, but they have affected everybody north, and they have moved, started to shift trade networks um, more, um, uh, more intensely through the dry lands. Um, so I think that we can see this as uh, the, this, so I think this plays into this increasing interaction and trade, and we can, might be able to think of this site as local mobile pastoralist communities kind of innovating, mimicking, kind of dealing with the pressures that they're feeling and the new opportunities that are, are arising, um, and also kind of responding to the, the increased interaction that they're having with, um, with uh, these other communities. Um, and this would kind of fall in so recently, uh, Israel Finkelstein, uh, uh, an archaeologist, commented that the, it's interesting that the abandonment of the site uh, coincides. Um, it's really unclear like, why the site was abandoned. Um, so it's interesting that the site was abandoned around the same time that the Assyrians do move directly into the dry lands. And it looks like the Assyrians moved the main trade route and like, shifted it through the northern Negev. So the abandonment of the site would coincide with the Assyrians um, uh, making that move in the region. So I'm not really going to talk too much about Horvat Keep Me, except to say that it becomes then uh, a, a, a nice way for me to compare uh, with Kintilla to the Kintilla as wrote and talk about, because Keep Me is a few decades later after the Assyrians have kind of made their impression and their movement into the dry lands. Um, and, but also they're using, um, but the Assyrians aren't like the Romans. Are, are other, they're, they don't like hang out and like make people do things. They usually, they use proxies. Um, and in the Northern Negev, they were using the local client, the local client polity of Judah up to the north. So this, this area becomes in, in, in uh, and is often uh, similar to this area in previous time periods because it's a highly interactive space. Um, this is an area where you can settle, you can do agriculture. It's semi-arid. You can um, you have actual settlements. Um, you can build some some very nice villages. Um, and so this area becomes a, a huge contact zone between mobile pastoralist communities and sedentary populations. And you have sedentary communities that are, um, are kind of flowing down in here as well, and you have mobile pastoralist communities that are um, they're kind of doing a semi-pastoral, semi-sedentary kind of thing as well, whatever that means. Um, and, um, and the site is interesting, so this site, ooh, ooh. so this site is interesting then because unlike Kuntil and Ejrod, it's very close to a lot of things. It's only like an hour's walk from the site of Tel Mahata, and it is visible from several other sites. Um, the site is also interesting in that, so it's got a standing stone little installation going on right here. They're a lot near the site. You see there's visible cairns and tumuli. Um, 
And so very likely, this site beca it becomes this, high, is this site of highly interactive space between um, the communities at, of, of the Northern Negev, especially at Tal Mahata, um, and, um, and so that's the, the ritual practitioners who are at Kim'i might have even lived at Tel Mahata sometimes. Um, and it, it's kind of, they're intimately kind of bound up with each other. Um, and just to show you how you can really see this in the material culture, um, these are a couple of items um, that are from Horvat Kitmeet. Um, this is a guy who's from uh, Tel Makata. And there's also a relationship between the site and another site in the, um, in the, eastern, uh, in the eastern Negev. Um, showing that there's kind of a flow of material, showing this flow of materials and communities and people and now in this east-west direction that wasn't uh, quite as um, evident in, in, during the 8th century BCE. So those are, that's, that's kind of still what I'm, I'm working on and trying to put together. Like I said, I was, I was hoping I'd have a nice grand big conclusion to give you um, <laughs> and something really snazzy to say, but th that's a kind of essentially where I'm at right now. That's okay. <laughs> and as usual, if you have to leave, feel free, but um, you're open to some questions. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. yeah, I had a question just about um, roads and roadways. Is there um, some way to see like ancient road paths? Is that, is that visible either um, on the ground or So anywhere? when it comes to, to the negative and Sinai, people haven't really mapped the roads. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're starting to, uh, basically, depending upon which area you're in. Um, and uh, <coughs> So a lot of times those, those those lines in the map that people are drawing for you is they're just like well there's a site here and there's a site here so there's probably a road between them. Yeah. Uh, there's only there's been very little work showing um, where the are though, which kind of areas that you draw. Yeah. Yeah. So because uh, I know there's the, like corona imagery in in the in Iraq that shows that can show those maps sort of, but I don't know if there's something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's something I was gonna try to look into but may not look into before I. Finish. Maybe consider it another project. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if there's any sort of direct evidence that these Iron Age people were somehow engaging with the early Bronze Age Calcolithic standing structure you talked about before. You find, you find later materials at, at these okay. sites. So people were doing Yes, yes, yeah. So that's, that's your basic um, idea that this is a sedimented landscape and that it becomes more and more powerful is that the Iron Age people are aware of all the earlier things and, and to think of that as a particular kind of space, particular, different than the surrounding space. Yeah, um, so all the time when people talk about the Iron Age, um, they either, they don't really explicitly bring up the materials that come before. Um, they kind of act like this was an empty landscape who came along in the Iron Age and built up some new things. And they never noticed or looked at anything else that was already in the landscape. Um, but uh, I, in, in the other parts of the Labat, things actually do get buried. Um, so you, the landscape is changing, but it may not be as obvious to you as what was there before. With well, this landscape, the stuff is just out there, it's sitting there. And um, I kind of wanted to look in these, at these materials in the context of if we're looking at these materials and thinking about them, then people in the past were also doing that. And then that may have played into their sense of the landscape and why they built things the way they did when they did. Thank you very much. So if I follow along with that theme, and um, I realize that you only have the pictures you've got for us, but your Iron Age site that we spent time on is fascinating and you said it's near holes of water or wells. Wells. Wells dug by people. They're natural wells. So there's holes in the ground with water bubbling up like spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and clearly people given the region must have known very much about that. So do you have these polymcestic, i.e. these earlier edifices or geoglyphs around those wells? Meaning, you're, you're just showing us the Iron Age site. I'm assuming if we just zeroed in on a kilometer around the wells, 
not only would you have your path, but would you would have yeah. I'm not saying it's super late. Are you finding a whole range of earlier structures or archaeological remains in that area? So really this Iron Age structure so, um, is is along the line of a sequence mm -hmm. of people spending time there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, why is this, I mean, why is this so different? Or is, it, is the influence the structure of your big structure coming? And in a way, you were suggesting that it's a um, like a fort, an effigy of a fort. Yeah, yeah. it looks like, like a fort, mimicking, but like but other mimics, but forts yeah. from the greater region, which I don't know, mm -hmm. from some bigger region. Some people are going there and spending enough time while they feel that. But what about the, your ritual side of this discussion? These funny objects that you unknown mm -hmm. bits on the map that you're now knowing about. How do those link to your earlier palimpsestic rituals and where I mean where are they getting their ideas? The Iron Age ritual part of that. Is that from the neighboring palimpsest? I mean what's the memory being played out in the um, so that, I mean, that's, that's something I'm kind of trying to work through here now and, and with what's happening in the Iron Age. Um, I think that um, there's been these long traditions in which they're interacting. Sometimes they kind of inherit their traditions or they create a new traditions about these spaces and what's going on there. And they, let's see how it looks. And I think that they're kind of bringing in different strands from both what was kind of already there in the landscape and these new interactions that they're having. So they have this long tradition of kind of these open air ritual sites, um, and then it's very interesting to then build something that kind of looks like a fort. Um, and then the reason why that's interesting is because in the southern Levant, there is a long history of ritual spaces that look like fortress architecture. There's a, a, an interaction going on bringing in notions of power, prestige, and protection having to do with, with ritual. So it seems to me that they are um, intentionally calling in these, these kind of different aspects that they are encountering, both in, their, in, both in traditions that were already there and in things that are, have been kind of flowed in from other places. I don't know about that. Well, it's murky. Yeah. It? I mean, you've got a series of different architectural existences mm -hmm. across that landscape. And some are clustered and some are not. And here you've got at least some clustering around this very important location. One, because it's water, and two, it's on road. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> They're probably linked even there. So it's going to be a, a key location. Mm -hmm. So lots of different people are going to be passing through there. So the question is, what was it about those styles of materialization, if you will, that made them do what they did. I mean, we've got we've mentioned the fortress, but what about these other kind of weird structures that you seem to be alluding are sort of the core of the deep religion or the mm -hmm. deeper meaningful landscape of religion as opposed to the fortress? At least that's the way I heard you speaking. Mean, if I missed that, mm -hmm. please clarify. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's it about that cluster of structures? Do you think that that's a new manifestation of? Ritual architecture marking the landscape or playing off of what's around there or mimicking anything? What do you think about those? The, the, the earlier materials that are no, <coughs> built in. You had two structures, okay, right? A and B, I think it was B. Okay. But the bits you said, oh, it wasn't on the map, so it was learning about it. Yes. And you seem to allude that that was the core, okay. that okay. was the sacred, sacred. Okay. The yeah. place of rich, more, you know, more, more obvious ritual, mm -hmm. which would suggest that it had somehow in its manifestation it has more meaning, mm -hmm. deep meaning. So I guess I'm trying to ask about that and how that might, how does that link into this larger landscape history, both memory, memory or yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so this is something that I'm trying to work through with the site. Um, uh, and like I said, I, I 
tended to have it more done before now, and that is that uh, there's kind of these processes. Um, there's these strange, the site is strange, everyone thinks the site looks strange, but uh, there's also kind of issues of, um, of what was preserved. There's been a lot of erosion that's been moving at the site, and so that front area seems to be where there were certain rituals going on, and then you go in back into the building A area, um, seems to be where there were kind of different set of rituals going on and perhaps some ritual storage happening mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I I would really like, and I wish the site had been excavated and published in such a way, uh, that I could talk about the site more in the context of um, relating those specific materials to um, what is in and around the site, to those, to those older um, so those geoglyphs, you know, which I can like name and tell you exactly where those geoglyphs are. <laughs> just, Meshel just writes that, you know, they're visible from the, from the mountaintop. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, there's, you know, been very little kind of survey work um, done in that area, especially if you that's like, that's art that's actually published in ways. So this is kind of what I am trying to kind of struggle through now with this particular site. It's definitely, yeah, sort of. Well, with like your memory, yeah, to follow up on this, I mean, because I think this is actually, it's at, and you absolutely understand that you're working through it right now. Mm -hmm. But what you're telling us is that people had to come through that more ambiguous architectural um, complex to come up to the big building, which was the only thing that, that people knew about. Mm -hmm. And that, that, complex of features has at least one feature that is the kind of thing you would find out away from sites, right? The, the place of ritual, the, the one that you said looked like, I can't remember the word. Like a mountain yeah. of rock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Is like it's so a that's, one. Like that's the kind of thing that would normally be built somewhere without all the without all the architecture, right? That's how you gather where um, you in, in, 11, in, a, in a traditional Levantine context, it actually makes perfect sense for where it's at. So as you can see, it's, 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 yeah, it has, it's in, in the front area, yeah. as you're working your way through, like, you would be like, if you had a, like, a typical Levantine temple, you'd have, like, the temple, which um, very often people weren't, people who weren't, uh, the priests would go inside, and you had all this ritual happening in the courtyard in front of the temple. So this, if this actually, in that sense, is structurally, mm -hmm. Um, creating that space of, and again, your liminality concept is very useful here because it's a liminal space within a liminal landscape, within a liminal um, way of being with respect to everything that came before, right? That's what you're trying to yeah. do is yeah. talk about. Yeah. yeah. So that it becomes a very powerful place because of those, um, those different registers of liminality. Mm -hmm. Even though the preserved features are relatively modest, um, you know that that's the sort of resonant center mm -hmm. like it's for most people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then for me, what's, what's interesting is the contrast between that and the very formalized and very explicitly um, uh, labeled, you know, they, in fact, they're writing on the jars and on the walls, and it, there's no way you can miss the message in the other part. Mm -hmm. There is a specific religious content there that you're being forced to engage with, which is different than the other part, right? Mm -hmm. The other part actually works more with sacredness as a general mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we are too. It, it, earlier, harking back more early than the fortress, mm -hmm. right? Is that that front stuff might be harking more to the memory of the earlier times? Fortress, which is Iron Age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've also, so um, I think part of the reason is that the site has um, perplexed people because um, I, I think, and when I'm showing you guys that there's there's evidence that there was ritual happening here, um, but the site also lacks uh, certain evidence of ritual that we expect to see in, um, in your typical Levantine context. Um, and so this is this is why people have often argued over whether or not to identify the site as a ritual site and, 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 and how you categorize it then. Um, and in my analysis, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is 
demonstrates that that, the, that lack of materials is a choice that's being made in, in the context of the landscape in which those materials, because those materials don't appear at ritual sites in the Sinai and Negev, mm -hmm. in, uh, in those previous millennia. Um, so I see that as this is a site where people are, are making choices based upon traditions that are already there and, and bringing in and interacting with, with these other um, notions that are coming into them. Yeah, so that's, that's basically exactly what we were, we were thinking you were saying. Sorry, I've had very little sleep, so. <laughs> But if not, maybe, or you maybe want to come and actually talk directly to Andrea, but I think we should answer first. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, um, the person that you have interesting material in.